I knew I loved the business and I knew I wanted to get involved, but I just didn't know where. And when I finished college, I moved back to the East Coast and uh, there was a cameraman who had equipment, but he needed a sound person. And now, 15 years later, I wouldn't trade the department. I wouldn't want to be in camera or art department or wherever. The joke I say, sound found me. Cut, cut the rehearsal. Just a second, please. My position is not as technical as the location mixer. Sometimes the location sound mixer would be sequestered off in a room or around a corner. So he needs a set of eyes on set. So I would be that person. Good speed. I can't hear you. So going underneath there was a bit better than staying up out because I was getting snookered by some of the lights. I would be out trying to catch the dialogue, whether it be with a boom microphone on the end of a stick or we'll put lavaliers on, on different actors. Our job is to just try to match what, what the audience sees so that your brain, it makes sense to your brain that it should sound like that. If the person's a half a mile away and it sounds like he's just this close, then it doesn't really sound right. And there's lots of tricks that they can EQ it and add things, and you know, with uh, with music, all these other things, it can make it, and it just sort of fits the soundtrack. I've got to know how to hook up the microphones. Sometimes I had to put body mics on actors, and I'll go to their dressing room or to their trailer, and we'll work together with wardrobe and try to find the best place for everybody. Once you put a microphone on an actor, Anytime an actor has actions or whatever, uh, it takes away the quality of the sound. Colin Fu, he has an ankle strap on, so he might be thinking about that while he's trying to deliver his lines. Our philosophy is don't use them unless we absolutely have to. What VRL and I decided would be a good idea is to plant a mic on a chair so we don't have to body mic the actors. We've adapted this rubber mount. The most important part is placing it so that we don't see it on camera, ever. So I gotta make sure everything is taped down and then the chair is mic'd, as well as the actor. This one extends out to 12 feet. It has, uh, it has three sections. And my other one, it goes out to 16 feet, which is standard for a boom operator. They telescope out to whatever length you need, and they come back in. But at the smallest, they still have a fair amount of length. I'm trying to catch all the dialogue in the scene. And you're holding on to the stick for long periods of time, and it can get heavy. Each show you get on, you learn a little trick here. You know, you learn what doesn't work. Like, uh, we were using one of our outdoor mics inside, and uh, because some of background noise was really prevalent, and what was happening is that if I was off a little bit, then I was off. But on a mic, something like this one, you can get both. And I'll, I'll bring it down into frame. So this is the mic we're using primarily on this show. It's an AKG, and basically, uh, for outdoors, it'll be wrapped up in a Zeppelin. Don't show all the secrets. Oh, can't tell you all the secrets, but normally outside, would be wrapped up in this with material over it for wind and stuff. The suspension, different microphones use different suspensions so that when we're having to move them fast and that, they, they you know, this is locked in there so it's not going to bounce around and make all kinds of uh, rattling noise. And then for inside, for quick panning, we uh, we put on a, that's a, a windsock of sorts. But now this little white tape here is so when I'm in the frame and all of a sudden this starts creeping in there. Normally, the operator can see the white so fast, whereas if it's just pure black, the viewfinder is in black and white, so he won't see it until it's too late. And sometimes in the frame, we have a safety. So if I start to creep into the safety, he sees it. They might dear, give me a finger, like, up, 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 up. Oh, there it is. You're out, Frank. You're out there. I have to learn the dialogue so I can try to get the dialogue. I don't have to be able to say it. I just got to be able to remember it. We can be anyone, anywhere, forever. Free, immortal spirits. As long as you stay in the jar. <laughs> Come on, man. When was the last time you saw a jarred brain pick up a real hot looking man? The, the boom is patched through the mixer. And to the mixer, I'm just adjusting levels every time. And it depends on the angles of the boom and depends on the levels the people are speaking. So I have to compensate sometimes and I have to avoid um, ambient noises as well. So I have to keep them balanced. We get the good soundtrack that the, the editors desperately want and the producers desperately want. And the actors, most of them hate to go back into the studio to re record stuff. But, uh, you know, cross our fingers and uh, hope the elements will cooperate. If you go in on set and you try to be a bull in a china shop, chances are people are not gonna try to help you out. But if you try to go and approach them and say, look, we have some concerns, and you try to bring it to the table and explain it succinctly, 
then the director might say, well, I can maybe do this, or an actor doesn't have to do that, or a DP could help and say, well, maybe I can position the light a little differently, or we can set a flag for you. So it's sort of like, and as you get more time spent on set, you learn what's needed and where the troubles are. In a word, I love it. You know, it's, I'm in that 5% definitely that like what they do for a living. You have to have a very understanding partner. Uh, the one thing for sure is that if it's a person that's in a job that's nine to five weekends off, they're probably not going to really understand how you could be gone till two o'clock in the morning one day and then up and gone at seven o'clock the next day. The reality of what we're shooting behind us and the equipment we're using, you might get proficient on stuff in school, but you jump over to the real world and not everybody's going to give you a chance to handle a $50,000 camera right away. This is the favorite part of my job. It's uh, cabling out to the camera. I, I, I really love it, and for those guys and girls out there that are going to get into it, this is the kind of thing you're going to start to love. I lie like a rug. The foundation I got in school still helps in so many areas now because I learned a little bit about producing, a little bit about production managing, uh, camera, and everything, so that when I showed up on set, even though it wasn't the same equipment, it was certainly, I, I sort of knew what they were, what it was. If you can get up to speed on electronics, understanding soldering, you know, what happens to a sound when it goes through the air, microphone patterns. In a lot of communities, there's no schools for this. Sometimes you gotta move to go to the bigger centers to get the education and or the opportunities for work experience. And if you're not prepared to move and go after it, then you might be sad at the end of the day because it hasn't come to visit you in the sound department, every time you go to work with somebody, they'll, they'll show you some of their tricks, and then you take them tricks and go to the next person. So by the end of the 50 shows, we'll say, you've got a fair resume in your back pocket of tricks that you've just learned that no school would ever teach you. So it's that kind of stuff, you know. You, you really gotta be game to going after it, and if you are, then nothing's gonna stop you. And the day in paradise. I'm gonna go deal with the cables, because that's my life.